Hello Internets, this video will be refuting what I consider to be the most common and damaging arguments by Vosh. And yes, I know, in the chat I had with Doomer Politics, now Doomer Media, I stated I didn't want to make more Vosh content. To a degree, that is still true, however, the point of this video is actually the start of a series dealing with common arguments made by progressive YouTubers, or BreadTubers as they are called. I see a lot of content making fun of them, but not enough content centered around using objective reason to directly refute their often ridiculous claims. So hopefully this will teach people how to better address these arguments when you see them creep into other parts of the internet or even real life sometimes. I will be including some zings, memes, and some other curveballs as well just to keep things entertaining, but these videos will largely focus on attacking their arguments in order to spread better awareness of the intellectual dishonesty being displayed by this side of YouTube. So without further rambling, let's get into it. Starting with the Coconut Island analogy. Wait, wait, I just, I'm saying a voluntary system. If it's voluntary, where's the coercion? Like, are you implying oh, no. some other okay. definition wait, let me, of coercion wait, let me, here? Let me ask you a Did very, let me ask you a basic question, okay? Let's say that you are on a plane and that plane crash lands on an island, okay? Um, there are only a few survivors. In fact, there are only two. And you wake up after the first one does. By the time that you have woken okay. up, the other survivor in this plane has claimed all of the coconuts on all of the coconut trees, stacked them on their pile, sheltered that pile with all the wreckage from okay. the plane, and declared sure. they own it. And they say that they would be willing to give you said coconuts if you throat their cock. Now, would you okay, consider no, that no, to be so a that's... voluntary interaction? <laughs> Is that a voluntary interaction? Okay. I've talked about the coconut island analogy before, it's a textbook example of something called an ignoratio elenchi fallacy, also known as missing the point. It is when an argument proves a different point than what it was intended to make, often due to having incorrect assumptions baked into the argument. Vosh is trying to prove the point that the free market is exploitative and coercive by equating it to this guy who owns all the coconuts and demanding inappropriate favors for them. Thing is, free markets generally have multiple goods and services with multiple people exchanging said goods. A person who makes unreasonable demands will generally price themselves out of the market. The only time a problem similar to the coconut island analogy would come up is when there is only one person in control of an essential good, i.e. a monopoly. So in other words, Vosh's coconut island actually just proves the point that monopolies are coercive, not so much his intended point that capitalism is coercive. And the unproven assertion being made by Vosh here is that the free markets are more likely to result in monopolies than socialism. This is demonstrably untrue. The vast majority of times that collectivizing ownership of the means of production has been attempted, it ended in government control of the means of production, which is pretty much the worst possible monopoly you can have, as the government owning all the coconuts gives citizens zero recourse, resulting in people having to literally worship their dear leader's statues in hopes that they'll toss a coconut their way. Of course, what many socialists, Vosh included, will do here next is cry foul over comparing things to Marxist-Leninist states. The issue with that is they are no longer comparing capitalism to socialism, but to a utopian ideal of socialism that, of course, has never been tried. This is never an honest argument. Anyone can just as easily come up with a utopian version of capitalism as a counter comparison. It's just not a good analogy. The reality is every economic and political system humans have come up with has had to deal with the threat of monopolized power. And the funny thing is that if you want to get super literal on this, the Coconut Island analogy actually specifically showcases how the problem can arise from an anarcho-primitive society. Oh, and bonus refutation, Squid Game. Great series, but not so great of a critique of capitalism for the same logical problem. Excellent showcase of the issues with too much power in the hands of a few, not so great of a showcase of issues unique to the free market. Number two, false accusations of fascism and bigotry. Um, it, I mean, in reality, he's, he's, he's basically just like a white nationalist. While it's true that Jordan Peterson does express, like, Nazi conspiracy theories. And what we call the fascist neocons, TPUSA, Ben Shapiro, so on and so forth. It's no secret that Vosh likes to call moderate conservatives white supremacists and neo-Nazis based on shaky interpretations of what they have said. The problem with it on a logical level is obviously that it's a dishonest, slippery slope. To demonstrate this, let's take Jordan Peterson as an example, whom Vosh has indeed accused of being a fascist. To test this, I give him the advocate's political compass test based on things he has said in the past to the best I could find. He comes out as a right-leaning moderate, not even in the authoritarian square, let alone fascist 
fascist. What Vosh basically does is he accuses people of fascist rhetoric not based on an honest assessment of what they actually believe, but based on this strange, unproven idea that anything right-leaning inevitably leads to fascism. Now, Doomer also did a take on this, and his conclusion was simply that Vosh treats conservatives with bad faith. Which is true, Vosh absolutely does this. However, I suspect that's only half the story. Let's take a look at another thing Jordan Peterson has said. On the right, I think we've identified markers for people who've gone too far in their ideological presuppositions. And it looks to me like the marker we've identified is racial superiority. So, the, so what's interesting is that on the conservative side of the spectrum, we've figured out how to box in the radicals and say, no, you're outside the domain of acceptable opinion. Now, here's the issue. We know that things can go far, too far on the right. And we know that things can go too far on the left. But we don't know what the markers are for going too far on the left. It may doom the liberal left project. Like, the lefties have their point. They're, they're driven fundamentally by a horror of inequality and the catastrophes that inequality produces. And fair enough, because inequality is a massive social force and it does produce it can produce catastrophic consequences. So to be concerned about that politically is reasonable. But we do know that that concern can go too far. Ridiculously inaccurate accusations are often psychological projection. People subconsciously dislike certain qualities about themselves they would rather not admit to, so they project as a means of cope. The right knows darn well where to draw the line and to not cross it. People who do cross this line are generally rejected by all other conservatives who do not. It's the left that has a problem these days with not knowing where to draw that line. And I suspect this is the true reason for Vosh and many other far leftists constantly using this slippery slope against anyone to the right of Obama. Marxists, in their endless attempts to convince people to try socialist experiment number 9001 that will totally work this time, have clearly crossed into the deep end of insanity. And so they falsely assume that everyone on the right in any way must be similar doomed into crossing into the deep end as well. And Vosh's tendency to use this dishonest reasoning just actively encourages others to double down on it, creating a sort of echo chamber of projection. Big yikes. The wealthy don't pay income taxes because mustonks. Elon Musk did not pay very much in taxes uh, back in 2020 when he made a bajillion dollars. Seriously, like a bajillion like. What was it, like a hundred billion in one year? Like a hundred fifty billion? It was some insane amount of money. And he did it through the appreciation of the stock that he owns because of the change in the price of the shares. That is income. You understand, yes? It is income. But it's not taxed as income. Uh, it is uh, only taxed if you sell it. Because like all ultra wealthy people, Elon Musk's brain uh, is a uh, is a a shadowy miasma of hate and greed. Uh, like all ultra wealthy people, his body has been uh, uh, bled out and burnt out from the inside uh, until he's nothing more than a um, a hollow puppet for some kind of horrific Lovecraftian entity. He's a demon. He is from hell, <clears throat> like all billionaires, but especially him. Dead. I'll be laughing over your grave, and also will not pay my taxes that fiscal year. This is from a more recent video of Vosh, where he restates a few things he has said in the past, although this time he goes mask off in regards to showing how rabidly butthurt socialists get over the existence of successful people. The combination of you and Post? Yes. And this Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> While he didn't go full-on fixed pie policy, it's the main reason I would think of, other than Twitter banter, for this very comical but also very irrational hatred of Elon Musk. It cannot be understated that wealth is not a zero-sum game. This is probably the number one economics myth that people continue to believe in for some strange reason. Elon Musk having lots of stock in his own business is not the reason other people don't have stuff. In fact, with businesses like Tesla that make money off developing and creating products, they tend to add more to the economy than take away, creating a positive sum game where everyone benefits. But more importantly is this very incorrect take on taxes. Just because certain people make their money in stock doesn't always mean that they are somehow avoiding the tax man. When it comes to being paid on non-qualified stock options, you actually do have to pay income taxes on them. NSOs, as they are called, are taxed at the applicable income tax rate when you exercise them, and you also owe taxes at the end when you make additional money with them. The odd thing here 
here is the answer to this is right in front of Vosh's face on the article he's looking at when it comes to Elon Musk. That $15 billion in taxes where Musk owes is mostly from his NSO, at an income tax rate of 54%. And then on top of that, as a business owner, you also have to deal with corporate and excise taxes and hundreds of other possible mandatory fees. This idea that Musk is somehow cheating the system because he is only taxed once in regards to stonks is factually incorrect. With NSOs, you actually are taxed twice, so I don't know what Vosh is talking about here, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't either. The reality is the wealthy already pay quite a lot in taxes, and trying to claim they don't pay hardly any taxes by spreading blatant misinfo about how stock options work is certainly not helpful. I would argue that taxes and government size in general should both be reduced, but that's a topic for another day, so instead let's move on. Colorblindness is racist. The real reason, of course, why colorblindness is racist is because it obfuscates uh, problems that are aligned along racial lines. Uh, when you make yourself colorblind, you make yourself blind to problems aligned with color as well. Uh, much in the same way that imagine if a person was talking about anti-Semitism and you were like, dude, plenty of people have like spray paint on their buildings or like violence against them. Why are we? I don't see religion. I just see like violence. We need to stop violence. Here's a simple thought experiment. Imagine you have a society of red and blue people. Suppose there are some angry mutant bees released into this society. The mutant bees disproportionately attack blue people more often at a rate of 2 to 1. Now, which of these options is more likely to solve the problem? Educate red people about their privilege and being 50% less likely to be attacked by mutant bees. Encourage a dialogue between red and blues about discussing their unique problems aligned on the lines of their color. Demonize anyone who thinks said dialogue is a waste of time. Separate people into victim and oppressor groups. And blah 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 blah. My systemic blah blah blah. Institutional systemic discrimination. Blah 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 blah. Option two: exterminate the fucking bees. Now ask yourself this, if you never even looked at which group the mutant bees were attacking more often, would it change the fact that option two most efficiently solves the problem? No, in fact this hypothetical society would probably be better off. Less time bickering over who is standing in the bigger shit pile, more time spent digging out of the shit pile. Again, you are not denying the possibility that someone is standing in more shit, you are just denying its relevancy towards solving the problem, because the vast majority of the time, it's not relevant. Identity politics are therefore usually more of a detrimental red herring than a helpful element. What Vosh is trying to do here is argue semantics to misrepresent colorblindness as if it's some kind of denial of history. All colorblindness means is that you judge people as individuals and try not to factor in race, except for in cases where problems cannot be solved unless you do so. It does not mean you deny that racial disparities exist. For example, I have never seen anyone deny the fact that black people are more likely to be poor in America. Even the most mouth-foaming neo-Nazi I have ever debated did not deny this fact. It just means that you recognize that reasons other than discrimination can exist for disparate outcomes, and try to focus on researching what the true reason is for a problem, then only factoring in race when the evidence actually shows discrimination, as opposed to starting with that assumption and looking for whatever evidence you can find to support your woke ideology. The problem here is that Vosh, like many modern progressives, just screams discrimination at the top of their lungs when ever outcomes are not equal. They either immediately assume it's discrimination before evidence is even looked at, or they do an extremely piss poor job at looking at the evidence and then conclude discrimination based on a very bad faith inquiry that fails to control for other possible variables. I covered this extensively in my video on the equity policy, and I will link it at the end in case anyone wants a more in-depth explanation for why Vosh, as well as the mainstream institutions that also push this nonsense, are completely in the wrong here. Socialism only fails because of embargoes. As a foreign policy tool, the embargo actually enhances Castro's standing by giving him a handy excuse for the failures of his homegrown Caribbean socialism. Dude, this section is called a half century of failure. Are you fucking kidding me? Uh, yeah, you know, we just uh, postured against Cuba, tried to kill their leader 500 times, and also embargoed them, making them one of the most embargoed and sanctioned countries basically in the history of the world. But actually, that benefits them, because then all their natural socialist failures, they can, they can scapegoat them on the embargo. If the embargo were lifted, the Cuban people would be a bit less deprived and Castro would have no one else to blame for the shortage and stagnation that will persist without real market reforms. What the fuck are we talking about, dude? Oh yeah, you're you're lucky that I just shot you in the leg, bro. Because if it weren't for that, then you would have nothing to blame your slow running speed on. 
The classic Ma Embargo's argument is the standard unfalsifiable victimhood statement that you will hear from socialists. It's a defense often used by tankies a lot more often than Vosh, who considers himself to be more of a lib left, but this is an instance where Vosh uses it. There are three major problems with it. The first is that these embargoes generally occur because a communist party seizes ownership of private companies, which is a nice way of saying that they steal them, and then said dictatorship expects other free market countries to trade with them with said stolen goods. Imagine someone steals your car and then seriously expects you to buy it back from them. Absolutely absurd. This, by the way, is exactly what happened in Cuba. In 1960, Castro seized US-owned businesses, and then President Eisenhower embargoed him shortly after. Say what you want about all the assassination attempts, the embargo was a completely reasonable, highly justified response. Second, if socialism is such a great and progressive economic system that lifts people out of poverty and all that and leads to this amazing economic stability, then why should it matter if a supposedly inferior capitalist country refuses to do business with them? It's not like Cuba was completely cut off from trade by by the way, they could still do business with countries that were more amicable to socialism. Castro even received billions of funding and aid from the Soviet Union. So if socialism is so great, why couldn't they just successfully create their own parallel economy? And third, while the embargo did indeed reduce Cuba's economic capabilities with the US, blaming it as the main reason for Cuban problems is largely ignores Castro's history of human rights abuses. Castro publicly punished descendants, denied basic rights like free speech, barred elections, and then held sham elections, carried out reputation against innocent civilians, mismanaged his economy due to the failures of central planning, and of course he persecuted Catholics. Here's the reality. Socialist systems eventually fail because they inherently require giving power to an authoritarian entity for them to function. That entity then abuses their power, leading to a repressed people and a repressed economy. Embargoes are going to make this worse, of course, but they are not the silver bullet. The system at its core is fundamentally flawed. Socialists like Vosh will kick and scream and deny this until they are blue in the face claiming that true socialism doesn't need a state, but they have yet to actually prove said perfect, stateless, classless society can form outside utopian theory crafting. The right hates poor people. Remember, they fucking hate you if you're poor. It doesn't matter if you're conservative or progressive, okay? Being anti-woke isn't going to save you. If you're poor, these people despise you. Adam Carolla and Dennis Prager occasionally have some off takes, but hate the poor? Really? Ah, that's a major stretch, and considering I've seen this same comment directed elsewhere before from Vosh, it seems to be aimed at right-leaning economic thought in general. Which isn't surprising, because Vosh loves to straw man, so why not help perpetuate the blatant lie that conservatism equates to hating the poor? Well, as far as generosity goes, multiple studies have shown that conservatives donate a greater portion of their income to charity. This fact alone should be enough to convince any reasonable person that right-leaning doesn't automatically mean F the poor. But for the sake of completion, let's also look at policy. The general point you will get from socialists is that those of us who support free market capitalism are perpetuating inequality and suffering amongst the poor. But this is also demonstrably false. The free market does come with economic inequality sometimes, but it actually lifts up everyone else while doing so. So you have to ask yourself, if the system improves the wealth and quality of the life of the poor by 20%, but the rich also get 25% more, is that really a bad thing? Generally, the left wants to fix poverty with expanding government programs like social services and welfare entitlements, while the right-leaning position is to focus on the free market and encourage greater private charity, and that welfare should mainly provide bare minimums. There are also alternative ideas, such as replacing welfare with UBI in order to reduce bureaucracy. I could probably spend a long time on just this subject alone, but the point is that the difference between the right and left-leaning economical positions is more of a disagreement on how to best help the poor, rather than a hatred of the poor. So pointing to various conservatives and saying, these people hate the poor, is an extremely bad faith attack that doesn't add anything of value to the discussion of resolving poverty. Labor vouchers. I never really got behind participatory economics as a concept. I feel like the only real difficult question with like capitalism versus socialism is how much you believe humans are willing to do difficult, unfulfilling work without coercion. There's always something. You either have pay, which that's the common one these days. And back in ye olden days, it was you would fucking die if you didn't do this. So back when humans lived in tribal societies, there were probably lots of jobs nobody wanted to do, but it didn't matter because if that job didn't get done, everyone would fucking die. 
It's very hard to get people to participate in literally shit jobs that nobody wants to do. The free market does a good job dealing with this problem because due to supply and demand, the monetary incentive to do a job generally raises as the demand for that job increases. So people who choose to do them receive adequate compensation for their troubles. Now, Vosh actually rejects Paracon here, so you might be wondering why I'm including this on the list. Well, the reason lies in his proposed solution. Higher pay literally the only answer? Well, then you, keep, then you keep a market economy if you have pay. Or you get rid of capital and you have a secondary luxury good market that you get using pay that you get with unfulfilling jobs. Meaning that if you do jobs people generally don't want to do, you get money that you can't use to reinvest, but you can use it to purchase commodities. But that's like, a, that's kind of like a, a, like a um, labor voucher kind of solution. A labor voucher, I mean, this you're still using market incentives, but like, and then how do you incentivize these firms that sell the luxury goods to want these labor vouchers? It gets difficult. Wait, so the solution is to just give them a highly regulated version of currency backed by a highly regulated version of the market, both of which are kind of garbage? Now, let's think about that for a moment. The only way vouchers as a form of funny money would work is if you have an authoritative system that regulates how those restrictions are imposed and enforced on said currency and market. But then you end up with the state owning all the coconuts again. So when it comes down to it, there are really only a few ways to compare complete jobs that need to be done but everyone hates. 1. Automate the task with technology. 2. Give people an incentive to do it. Or 3. Forced labor. Now this is one of the many reasons why markets and prices are good. Prices allow people to act as if they have a far greater amount of information than they actually have, both for what they choose to buy and how they choose to earn money. It's a positive aspect of the free market, as explained by F.A. Hayek, that is often overlooked by modern progressives, and Vosch's deflection here just further perpetuates the ignorance. Here's the reality. When you kill market incentive, the most effective way to get certain things done is by forcing people to do it. And that's exactly why many dictatorships under the rule of a communist party ended up doing just that. Even if those regimes didn't exist in history, we would still be able to use this paradox to deduce that socialist revolutions are likely doomed to birth totalitarian governments. They are not an unfortunate thing that happened by chance as a result of wars or embargoes or other excuses. It's their inevitable conclusion. And last but certainly not least, Vosh produces the saddest attempt at refuting Thomas Sowell I have ever seen. This is the, uh, some people call it equity versus equality. Oh, equality of opportunity, thank you, yeah. Though honestly, I would argue even equality of opportunity is kind of a misnomer, um, because nobody has the same opportunities in life. It's more, do have we done everything we can to ensure that everyone's getting a fair shake, a fair chance at uh, um, an equal outcome? Not that everyone has an equal outcome, that's not possible, but everyone has access to the same basic freedoms and processes. Left claims to want equality. What do they mean by that? Do they mean equality of outcome, where we're all exactly the same? Well, that's impossible. Equality is impossible. This is the, I hear it every single fucking time. It's insane how often they do this. It's, uh, well, of course, uh, well, that can happen, actually, obviously. Nobody, let me be perfectly clear about this, nobody talks about equality of outcome. Nobody does. Absolutely nobody. Nobody. Zero people do. Okay? When we're talking about equality of outcome, the concept of equality of outcome is this nebulous, dystopic, uh, uh, like, concept that nobody seriously advocates for in politics. Nobody does. What Vosh is polling here is quite possibly the most absurd Mott and Bailey fallacy in the entirety of RedTube, to the point where Vosh comes dangerously close to debunking his own ideology. Let's unpack this. First off, Vosh heavily misrepresents equality of opportunity. All equality of opportunity means is that people have legal equality and society treats people the same regardless of age, caste, gender, race, and so on and so forth. It can also be phrased in its legal form as freedom from discrimination. It doesn't mean that everyone is going to have the same chance of success. That's impossible. For instance, someone born mentally disabled versus someone who is intellectually gifted, the latter is obviously going to have a much higher chance at earning a PhD one day. Trying to force them to be equal would as Vosh says himself, be dystopic and unobtainable. So Vosh retreats to the Mott and tries to gaslight that nobody makes the argument for equality of outcome. The problem is that's completely untrue. The basic debate on equality we see from aggressive these days is, again, the equity policy, where they are constantly getting triggered by unequal outcomes, asserting that statistical discrepancies between groups are usually discrimination, and demanding government regulation to enforce it as discriminatory. For instance, to quote Ibram X. Kendi, a racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between racial groups. 
By any faithful interpretation, we can safely say that anyone who deems unequal outcomes as unacceptable and discriminatory is blatantly advocating for equality of outcome. But of course, that's just progressive media along with Ibram X. Kendi. We are talking about Vosh here. So does Vosh ever make this argument? And that is racism by outcome, and that triggers the fuck out of conservatives. The idea that there can still be racist outcomes, even if nobody in the system is acting with a racial bias. All of these things are bad, and racism by outcome is the easiest thing of all to address because we do not need to prove intent on any level. S it. Significant disparities between different racial groups um, usually are indicative of some kind of underlying bias, yeah. We don't need to prove intent. We don't need to fuck around with who's in the wrong. We see an inequality, and we address it. Oh no, unequal outcomes. Intent doesn't matter. Gee, I wonder why this argument Vosh just made doesn't make sense. I don't know. Let's ask Vosh. Very simply, if you are born in this world, it is best that everyone have basically the same shot at being able to succeed. Does that mean everyone will succeed? No, of course not, obviously. Even in some perfect communist world or whatever, um, like where everyone's super perfectly equal or whatever, there will still be differences in people's performance. There will still be differences in people's outcomes. And I think that's a beautiful thing, by the way. I don't want to be exactly like anyone else. Nobody does. Everybody likes the variety in humanity that they see as a product of inequality of, 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 of outcome. Everybody likes that. Massive yikes. I don't even need to make a further argument here. The self-contradiction and self-own speaks for itself. So Vosh goes on to make further bad takes on what Thomas Sowell is saying, and I could refute those as well, but honestly I just don't see any reason or value. The premise that Vosh starts this response out with is so disconnected from reality and so ridiculously contradictory to everything else he's ever said that it makes it impossible to take anything else he says about Sowell seriously. Anything else to say on this subject would be better answered in the take I did on the equity policy, where I explained why expecting equality of outcome between groups makes just as little sense as expecting it to exist between individuals. Now we reach our conclusion. The problem with Vosh is that most of his arguments go like this. 1. Straw man his opposition, or Mott and Bailey his position. 2. Resort to nihilism, equivocation, semantics, rhetoric, and falsehoods when that doesn't work. 3. Falsely accuse everyone plus two or more to the right on the political compass of being a fascist. And 4. Claim victory. If you are someone who likes Vosh or enjoys his content for whatever reason, that's fine. Just don't take anything he says seriously, because much of his content has a predictable cycle of poor reasoning, misinformation, and hot takes on why everyone he doesn't like is a fascist, all for the sake of pushing a misguided socialist agenda. Anyways, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, subscribe.